I just want to say, uh, everyone, thank you first and welcome to another night of Suds and Science. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jason Hill. I am the host and coordinator of this series, and I'm a quantitative ecologist and conservation biologist at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies here in Vermont. Um, so our, just a little bit about ourselves, since I, a lot of people are signed up tonight from uh, New York and outside of our normal range of, of, uh, of attendance. So um, BC's work strives to advance wildlife conservation through a combination of scientific research and informed communities. And our research really does span the Western Hemisphere from Canada, we do a lot of work in the Caribbean and all the way down to South America. And we work from everything from birds to butterflies, the vernal pools and grasslands to spruce fir ecosystems like I do up on top of the mountains. Anywhere that we can use science to inform the management and conservation of those species and those ecosystems. And for those of you who are new to Suds and Science, just thank you so much for being here. You know, we used to meet right down the road at this local brew pub and our guest speaker would stand in front of a fireplace and we'd be surrounded uh, in 300, 360 degrees by the, the audience to be asking questions the whole time. There's never been PowerPoint. You know, Suds and Science has always been about creating a dialogue between scientists and those of us who use those that use that science. And I appreciate you entertaining me and, and trying entertaining us and trying out this format online tonight. We used to meet a local brew pub and now here we are all in our local basements, like the insect pinning, dungeon and dragon playing computer programming nerds that many of us are. Um, I'd like to point out a couple features to improve your Zoom experience tonight, if you're new to Zoom. If you move your mouse and scroll to the top of the page, you might see in the upper right-hand corner a little button that says view. And if you click on that, hopefully it's default and you haven't changed it and it says speaker view, and you're gonna see whoever's actively speaking, which is gonna be our speaker tonight and myself. Um, if it's accidentally switched to gallery view, you're gonna see a lot of blank um, boxes because everyone's got their cameras turned off. And at the bottom of the screen, if you scroll down and click on the chat button, you'll see that I've enabled chat tonight and it should be default, send a message to everyone. And this is a great way for you to send messages to myself and to my colleagues who are helping me monitor chat for questions. And if you have questions at any time tonight for our speaker, you just time it in right there. And I encourage you to, to send a message to everyone, not just me. Um, that way my, my coworkers who are helping me field questions from the attendees will be able to see it as well. And that way everyone else will be able to see the, the questions you asked. And just to get us going with the chat feature, make sure you can figure out where that is. If you want, at the bottom of the screen, click on chat there and then type in tonight what you are drinking for your beverage of choice. After all, this is Suds and Science. I'll type in myself. <laughs> there we go. Water Chardonnay and Sip of Sunshine, terrific. Well, um, and then before we go any, while everyone's typing in with that, are some good responses now. <laughs> if you forgot beverage, you should go grab one for sure. Uh, before we go any further, I also want to acknowledge that my house here in White River Junction sits on the ancestral lands of the Abenaki who are still here and have been here since ancient times. Um, I really couldn't be more excited to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Vivek Shandis. Vivek is the director and founder of the Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab, aka the Super Lab, at Portland State University, Portland, Oregon, folks from New England, where he's a professor of, of urban studies and planning. And this is on three uh, equally impressive in their own right areas of research. I say that but most of us try to amateurly understand one area of science and super lab, uh, just, just super, can't even say it. Quant um, areas of research um, in the super lab include quantifying the feedback between the envir environmental change and human behavior, developing community-based indicators for measuring social and environmental conditions, and characterizing the relationship between urban development patterns and environmental quality. Wow. I'm sure we're gonna cover a lot of ground tonight. We're gonna to start out by talking about urban heat waves and how they affect both humans and environmental health. And um, Vivek, great honor. Thank you for being here, really appreciate it. Thanks, Jason, this is great. I'm glad we've been able to work out a time for us to 
gathered and I've been learning a lot about Vermont lately. I've been in touch with some several folks at the state offices about all kinds of th things climate related. Really? You, you used to live out here somewhere, Albany or? Yeah, I, was, I went to school in upstate New York. I was at Cornell for a little bit, was at Rensselaer Polytechnic for a little bit. And I used to go cross country skiing all over Vermont and the Green Mountains and White Mountains of New Hampshire as well. So yeah, I'm, I, wow. I love the landscape. It's, it's like, it feels like Oregon is the West Coast Vermont, you know? <laughs> That's really what I think of it as. Right on. That's a, that's a long Nordic ski from Ithaca to <laughs> Vermont. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vermont, just like the Oregon, just like Oregon minus the amazing coastline. Um, yeah. yeah we, um, so I, I guess I just want to start it off by asking like, uh, how are you doing? Like, how are things out there? Uh, it's, it's, um, you know, wildfire has been on the mind for a lot of people lately. So it's, it's really, I'm thinking a lot about um, these days, just thinking about what we're seeing with the pandemic and the parallels between the pandemic and climate change. So I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm trying to really bring what I was telling my partner earlier in the week was just this idea of how to think about everything we experience as an opportunity to be learning something, you know, mm -hmm. and I get, you can get, I get sucked into things so deeply sometimes that it's hard to kind of dig out of them and to really think about what are we learning in this process? And pandemic has been really, especially now that we're starting to get some really consistent data, it's been very telling as to parallels between the pandemic response and what we might need for various issues around climate. Wow. Yeah. I'm glad that we have people who are flying at the 30,000 foot level like yourself who are able to lift their head up. Um, you know, my, my father used to say to me, you never really fail unless you fail to learn something. And I think that's tough in moments like COVID to, uh, you know, it's all hands on deck, just let's get through today, through tomorrow. But uh, I'm glad there are people thinking, you know, more strategically and hierarchical uh, about how we can learn from this. So that's great. Well, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, I also am a person of extraordinary privilege. Like I have a job, I have, um, you know, shelter, I have um, income that I can buy food with and that I have uh, health and, and family. So, I mean, it's, it's like I am trying to pay all this forward in whatever way I can. That's, that's definitely something that my father and uh, mother more recently would say quite a bit. Right on. Um, starting out our conversation tonight, and um, again, if folks, you have questions and you want to chip in any time, feel free to do so. And I'll, I'll try to organically weave that in as if I'm smart as you are. And I just fluidly came up with that question. But um, let, can we just start out with some just really basic stuff, um, asking about heat waves? Because I look, you know, preparing for tonight's conversation, I, I came across various, you know, definitions of what a heat wave is. And I I'm not sure myself, but what a heat wave is. Yeah, you're not the only one. It's a debated topic. Actually, you'd, you'd be surprised, like not only the definition of a heat wave, but also the measurement of heat. I mean, we've been checking our temperature since we were kids. And you'd think that, you know, we would have a good idea if it's above 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 uh, Celsius, we would have a fever and that would be a bad thing. And therefore we know what bad is. Um, but a heat wave is a remarkably, it's still debated a, a lot. It's some, some characterize it as um, kind of a, a threshold temperature when we have a heat warning that's issued by local state or by state agencies or even local authorities. Others are thinking about the long-term effects. Like if it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit for several days, that has a potential effect, maybe more so than a 95 degree day that's just, or a hundred degree day that's just one off kind of a thing. And so this is a, um, a topic of continuing debate and we don't have one, just like the topic of sustainability or term of sustainability or resilience, we don't have just one thing that defines those complex terms. And similarly with heat waves, it's an ongoing discussion though I have a few favorites myself um, and I'm happy to talk about. Is, I'm going to guess your favorite is not meteorological based, but is uh, yeah, re more, re more direct measure of human health or danger to human health. 
Yeah, yeah, that's part of what we're doing with climate change, right? We're trying to take these like, uh, at least I don't, I, I, trying to bring it down to the lived experience of place. And part of what I'm right picking on. on is we have meteorologists and climatologists that have very specific, often statistically derived measurements. And what I'm trying to think about more is what, in what ways do the different development patterns and the landscapes that we design and develop amplify temperatures? Because when you say it's 95 degrees in Burlington, like that could mean that it's 105 degrees in one part and 85 in another part. And it, it's more of kind of what we're experiencing in the places we, uh, we reside and whether we have access to air conditioning, whether we can run the air conditioner if we, we have it um, or the resources to be able to run it, uh, whether we have cooling resources in general. And so th those kinds of like um, dimensions of accessibility to being able to stay cool really drives a lot of what the impacts health impacts are from heat waves and so yeah the heat wave for me is much it, it's sure about temperature and we could think about thresholds but at the same time it's also about what um, is going to trigger community health impacts and and in some ways infrastructure impacts as well you know i've done uh used to do bird research on airport runways in, in between the airport runways and um, there's a lot of there's a lot of weather stations and a lot of weather centers at um, at airfields. Yeah. I, I just you just got me thinking there about you know how we measure temperature for a city and what the forecast is and um, you know where you know those locations might be biased towards maybe away from urban the areas of dense urban housing, the uh, concrete structures, and more towards open areas or. Yeah, by and large, I mean, what we're finding is the reading you get on like the weather channel or what you get as a pretty typical read of the temperature for your city as you get that kind of monolithic number often at a particular time. It's like, yeah, that's a good one could consider it an average for the area or one could even consider it maybe somewhat skewed to the left or skewed to the right of the graph of a temperature in your region. Um, Though, as we're starting to understand more and more, it's not quite as um, uniform as that. And it, it really varies quite a bit. But airports are kind of the go-to um, place for getting temperature measurements most across most parts of the world. Um, though I will note that the Environmental Protection Agency, various other federal agencies have uh, a set of local, often air quality monitors and other kinds of atmospheric measurements that are taken, including relative humidity and temperature, though those are often very few in terms of um, what we call synoptic measurements that are made in different parts, often only three to five parts of a relatively large metro region. So it's not really kind of a granular description of temperature across, across an urban environment um, that, that one might think would be easily available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I do a bit of research with modeling species distributions and, and long-term climate change. And I find myself constantly explaining like differences between weather and climate. Um, I'm wondering about the relationship between heat waves and climate change and what that relationship looks like. Yeah, there's more, it's not my area um, specifically because this gets into a whole set of kind of deeper global climate models that um, a lot of my colleagues at, at Caltech and, and NYU and other places that I, I know work on. Though, um, I mean, it goes without saying that you're trapping more, uh, you're trapping more radiation in the atmosphere, um, greenhouse gas effect, you, you one can, start to imagine that the amount of heat that's trapped in has been going up. I think Vermont's temperature, I was just doing a little bit of research before this on the state and, and the region. And, you know, in the last century, it's gone up about two degrees on average. And so overall kind of the, 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 um, per, the measurements, empirical measurements, as well as the modeled measurements have kind of a background effect of in, that are increasing over time. But, you know, the weather jumps up and down and goes very, um, each year, the highs, the number of days above 90, for example, is something meteorologists look at very commonly. And that goes up and down across the years, depending on all kinds of things. But in terms of heat waves, um, 
there's some really interesting papers that are coming out in terms of the um, uh, uh, the temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean and the frequency of heat waves that hit, for example, the mid-Atlantic and even New England to a certain degree. And so you can say that when the ocean temperatures and are um, X, that 60 days later, we're seeing a heat wave. It's almost predictive heat wave. And we've seen those increase in frequency and we're definitely seeing more and more heat waves. And there's some really cool graphics that are coming out now of showing over the last, you know, 50 years each calendar day, how many, how hot has it been? And you see it kind of getting more and more red as you get closer and closer to present day. So I think that trend will, that at least in current uh, estimations, that trend is going to increase. And not only is the overall background temperature going up, but we're also seeing um, the, the frequency, of course, and the magnitude of those heat waves increase. And so that that's where we're really trying to um, deepen our understanding, taking those global models and trying to say, what does that mean for a local region? And NOAA has been, I think, some of the forefront research on this. National right on. Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Right on. Um, and a uh, question from Liza, I thank you very much. And we'll definitely get to, she said she recently read a paper about the effects of structural racism and forms of redlining. You probably read Vivek's paper. <laughs> and we will definitely, uh, we'll definitely get to that um, and uh, address uh, the heat island effect on urban wildlife. Um, uh, along those lines, though, and, and um, I just, you know, curious, a lot, a lot of us here in Vermont uh, been, are, are well aware of uh, model forecast effects of climate change um, on invasive, disease, invasive insect outbreaks and potential loss of a lot of our charismatic megafauna, like potentially moose. Um, potentially other animals here, and thinking about heat waves and pushing animals to their stress point and beyond. Um, do you, can you comment on, you know, what are the effects of, you know, short-term heat waves on, on wildlife populations or on, you know, ecosystems? Um, yeah, it's not, it's not my direct right, area. Right. Yeah, it's not my direct area. I have been, I, I read in this area occasionally, and there was an article that just came out, I, one that I referenced Occasionally, it came out in 2008 um, by Garcia et al. that was looking at um, temperature altering um, biodiversity and ecosystem function that I really liked um, because they were just looking at kind of um, the extent to which thermal capacity of different species was, um, a, was affect, thermal capacity of different species and the extent to which a changing climate regime would really mean that these species uh, either migrate or die off, and the implications on broad scale biodiversity. And it, it, it really piqued my interest because, you know, heat, like many other things, is it, it's a byproduct of, of a lot of things that we do, not only to the landscape. And um, we, the species, in more generally, as you all know far better than I, especially those modeling, you know, uh, kind of metapopulation dynamics and things like that, you would all know better than I the idea that they're. The, um, species are very responsive to these to these fluctuations, arguably more so than at least Homo sapiens are. And we can just cool ourselves and you know find ourselves in in going to cooling, uh, not necessarily big oases, but in a sense, similarly whether in the house or outside. And so um, the thing about um, heat, though, we're we're seeing kind of this migration starting to play out on a on a larger scale and that species have been doing for millennia that's not necessarily new they've been doing it interannually but we're also seeing it now potentially even more permanently um, people often reference from an urban ecological perspective like Canada geese hanging around all year and things like that and like those kinds of things are more obvious to the everyday observer um, though I think there's some larger um, migrations afoot that several folks are starting to cue into and not only models, but I think what's amazing is the empirical evidence is starting to mount around that as well. Right on. I, I see, uh, I, as someone who involves uh, climate change in the research, I see tons of information studies addressing climate change impacts on ecosystem services, on wildlife populations. I, I, as someone who looks at the literature every day, I, you know, I, don't see research studies um, looking at the effects of heat waves. Um, the little bit that I've seen for birds, you know, kind of suggests that, you know, heat waves during breeding, for example, might cause birds to forego breeding that year, mm. um, have direct, direct fitness consequences. 
but definitely not an area that receives anywhere near the attention that it should or in compared to overall climate change. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I think that's an area that is just going to blow up in terms of scientific research in the coming decade. Mm. I, so in, in 2003, there was a, a meta heat wave that killed some 70,000 people. And, and I remember that. Um, people were worried about um, elderly people and, and without air conditioning and a less, who are less mobile. Um, and you know, I heard in another interview you gave where you said that heat waves were the, the leading cause of weather related deaths and kill more people than all other natural disasters combined. And I'm just, I want to understand how those deaths actually materialize. You know, what are the, how do heat waves kill people and, you know, have negative effects on, on the human body? Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, you're clearly reading widely and paying attention, Jason. It's cool to have this conversation this way because it's, it, um, like I was just seeing uh, a note from Tom here about factors that drive heat in urban versus rural. I'll just start with that and then get into your question maybe. Awesome. The idea of, yeah. the idea that, you know, we're building cities for human habitation and we're building it, it with the materials that we have tested over decades. And those materials weren't necessarily tested for their, for their ability to um, manage this long wave radiation, because what we get is this short wave radiation coming from the sun, pack fill energy packets that are coming in, they hit surfaces, they you know, either get absorbed, they, they get reflected, they, they dissipate or they absorb it and turn it into sugars and evapotranspire water, et cetera. So there's a few mechanisms by which the materials are actually reacting to the short wave radiation that we know of and part of what we're understanding is that the design of development and the area we're spending a lot of time on is getting more into the kind of urban design questions of the materials that are being used, the, um, the, the, like the physical materials that are being used, the configuration of physical, de of, of actual like buildings and development and the level at which, for example, um, convective movement of air can actually cool the surfaces of buildings how much there's shading in specific areas. There's all this work happening in LA now around shade and trying to figure out how to shade specific neighborhoods a bit more than others. But really in the city, we're putting in all this pavement, often a lot of asphalt, a uh, lot of big, big parking lots, you know, um, um, roof, roofs that absorb this, sidewalks, driveways, et cetera. And these are at the microclimatological level, really interesting because they, each of these things kind of interact with that heat in different ways. Whereas in rural environments, we end up often finding, for example, water being one of the most important factors of mediating the temperature. If you have a watered grassland, for example, a, a marshland, very different heat experience, ambient uh, temperature as well as land surface temperature, very different uh, experience or, or measurements of that, and as opposed to an open dry field, which in many ways acts a lot like, a, uh, might act a lot like a, um, a, a cement, um, open cement area because it just absorbs that heat and holds on to it. And then though lets it go faster than a cement material might, might you might imagine a um, cement holding onto it a little more tightly, that specific, um, gravity and that, that ability to hold on as opposed to a field that yes, absorbs, it gets really hot, but then also dissipates it really quickly. And so when you're talking about communities that are affected by this, as we all know, um, I mean, the, the go-to book for this is Eric Kleinenberg's um, heat wave that was all about 95, the 95 Chicago heat wave, which was called a social top autopsy of a natural disaster. And it was essentially identifying communities that uh, had excess, what's the term is excess mortality, excess morbidity, right? So those who would die, the, we have a death rate pretty standard throughout the year, but then this heat wave hits and you see the kind of bump in the graph of the amount of pe the number of people who die, which is essentially epidemiologists characterize as, a, as excess mortality. And so that excess mortality, you look at the locations where people died and it was largely places where it was, um, it was these, uh, um, multifamily residential buildings where communities would describe that they didn't want to leave their house 
their apartment because they were fearful of going outside. There was, uh, whether it's because of crime in the neighborhood, whether it's because of um, concerns of uh, just general safety, they didn't wanna leave the house. And so when bodies were found in these apartments, they were, their body temperatures were literally 140 degrees. So these were kinds of impacts that were socially constructed in many ways. And what we often say about heat waves is it's one of the, yes, more people die than, um, than all other natural disasters on an annual level in the US, notwithstanding the pandemic, of course. Um, yet at the same time, it's a highly preventable um, impact. Like the impacts are things like check on your neighbors, like these social programs during heat waves, making sure people are hydrated, making sure there's energy efficiency programs so people can run their AC. Um, there are programs this year in New York City and other parts of the country that where mayors were and, and county commissions were giving away air conditioners um, because the pandemic was forcing people inside their homes and heat was ha and, and they were concerned that people were going to be um, potentially um, affected fatalities from heat waves. So it was a um, challenge because especially where your energy is coming from, you're running more AC, you're contributing to greenhouse gases, that's potentially exacerbating the global planetary impact, but yet you're also saving lives in the short term. So there's some real interesting trade-offs that we're getting into with that, in that conversation. But fundamentally, it comes down to kind of the built environment, what's around it, the social perceptions that people have about their neighborhood, the extent to which you can ask your neighbors for help and things like that. And if you're not able to, then you're really stuck. And it's it, it, with somebody who's not very mobile, has pre-existing health conditions or an older adult, um, you're, you're looking at a perfect storm of events for heat waves. And so um, those are some of the social conditions that we really think about a lot. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 did, I guess I appreciate now that you, you explained that it makes sense that there's a strong behavioral component to it as well as, as, well as the direct effect of heat on the body. Uh, you know, it makes me think um, that, you know, uh, it, that it is a privilege to work inside my, you know, climate controlled home, that I know there are lots of people and, um, who, you know, when, like, when a heat wave would strike, like there, you'll see the, like, oh, my weather app will pop up on my phone. Like, oh, it's a bad day for ozone. It's a bad day for heat. You know, try to stay inside, get air conditioning. Okay. For those folks who are working outside, um, it, it's a difference between maybe choosing to risk your life and choosing to get a paycheck. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, those are, that's real stuff. And we tried a couple of research studies to go and talk to farmers, talk to roofers, talk to uh, oh, roofing. landscapers. Yeah, yeah. Boy, they are not comfortable talking to us as researchers about this because it really comes down to company policy and whether companies would allow for breaks. We did this and we tried this in Doha in the Middle East and we were threatened. And we tried this in uh, California and Sacramento region. We've tried this in, in um, Washington County, Oregon. And it, it, yeah, it's, it's a private industry question that comes up quite a bit, but there, the data on that are remarkably thin. Wow. I, having worked on a roofing crew, I can imagine uh, the dangers to begin with and with the heat wave, unbelievable. Um, yeah, uh, yeah I, that kind of leads us into, you know, talking about the, the urban heat campaign um, project that, you know, I think I shared, anyone who registered, if, you've, if you watched that brief, uh, really incredibly produced uh, two minute YouTube clip there, you, you saw a brief introduction to that research, but um, that's, that's the, the Vivix research where they, you know, outfit cars and bicycles with these, you know, incredibly sensitive temperature and humidity um, sensors. Can, can you tell us about this? Is it fair to call this a community science project? Yeah. 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 Can you tell us about that? Maybe, you know, some of the things you've already learned from it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I'll just admit that my, my bias is kind of the arc of my career where I went from a rather technical assessment of understanding um, satellite, of using satellite imagery to describe cities, describe regions and looking at time, time series analyses and things like that. And that's kind of where I cut my teeth in some of this stuff. And I realized quickly that those assessments while really helpful and really important, they were not often capturing the imagination of policymakers or community groups in terms of taking action locally. And so I was, it, there was something just kind of deeply um, 
um, I don't know, unsatisfactory about the outputs of that work because we could show that there were differences in the region. Um, and the, the idea of um, engaging communities in this work was always in the back of my mind. And it wasn't until we just started experimenting with some low cost sensors in doing some of this work that we said, what would it take to actually start um, engaging communities in their place? And one of, our, one of our early campaigns where we were in Richmond, Virginia, working with a, a Science Museum of Virginia, um, I remember a student who had, um, who had participated, who's, who you know, wasn't really interested in climate, wasn't really interested in environment, just was really not so keen on those things, was more interested in their phone. And, and I remember drinking lots of Pepsi Cola. And um, then we got into conversations and uh, after we did run the models and we came out with these outputs where we were showing the distribution of temperature, um, she looked at this and said, wait, you're telling me that my neighborhood is 15 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than my friend's neighborhood? And that's why I've been going over to my friend's house all the time, which in my lived experience, I mean, this is my language, but in the lived experience of my place, I can see why we're going over there all the time. And the, the moment that happened and she asked the question, why is that the case? She immediately started opening up this question as to what happened in my neighborhood or what happened in my friend's neighborhood that didn't happen in mine. And that opened up another conversation about um, who makes these decisions about what happens to neighborhoods? Who makes the decisions about who gets the green space, who doesn't get the green space, about who gets the, um, the, the building materials that are very porous and allow heat to come into the house and who gets those sealed buildings and other uh, designs that might prevent heat from coming into the home. And so it opened up a whole set of questions that weren't about climate, weren't about environment, or, but, though were about justice. And that's where it really started um, at least in my observation, opening up uh, the, the opportunity for, for asking questions about what I can do in my community and how I could um, actually be an agent of, of change. And so that early experience, those early experiences for me really were the light bulb that basically said, we need to be meeting people uh, I, I've kind of known this intuitively and experienced it myself, but uh, meeting people in where they are, what experiences they have of their region, having them describe it on their own, interpret these maps, interpret these outputs on their own and start um, asking those questions of why is this the case? And after doing about, you know, 15 of these or so, we, uh, we'd, people were asking like, I'll just maybe side maybe just give you a little sidestep to one of the first questions that were posed. Yeah. Um, it, it, people were asking, you know, why are we finding this pattern of, you know, these hot areas in these um, low income neighborhoods and these um, communities of color were often where these hottest neighborhoods were. And people would often, even scholars would say, you know, that's the luxury effect. It's just people who have more money are just spending more money on greening and kind of able to shade their neighborhoods and um, water their lawns and what have you. And it, that again was just so, um, yeah, so unsatisfying. And so what, what we did was start looking at some planning practices of, of redlining and how that played into it. And that was just remarkably consistent um, in terms of looking at where communities were redlined and what the temperatures were in those communities. And that's where it was like, oh yeah, it's not the luxury effect per se, it's really much more of a systemic, um, uh, a systemic issue that was about segregation, race, environmental racism, and lots of um, structural, uh, uh, structural policies that allowed access to some kinds of landscapes and not others. And so this has started a whole conversation about what it means to live in a red line versus a non-red line neighborhood. And, um, I mean, that's, so the community science piece allows an opening to have those more uh, structural conversations. So you don't um, identify, so it's not about an individual, it's not about the mayor, it's not about commission, ex city commission, county commission. It's more about kind of an entire system that has perpetuated these kinds of inequities and how can we actually identify where the system is falling short of being able to be more, um, more transparent and more uh, deliberate about centering historically disinvested 
areas of a city. Right on. Uh, and can I just back up and, and just to say, if for those folks who aren't, who remember what the term redlining in the past, and you know, it's where um, lenders deny financial services like loans and mortgages um, based on the applicant's race or, or, or ethnicity. Um, I, you know, you know, having grown up reading Howard Sin and other sources, you know, I think about, you know, redlining as a product of FDR and the New Deal and like that, that happened long ago. And that's done, you know, we outlawed that, that that's just not a thing anymore. Uh, and your research clearly, you know, made me, and of course, as soon as I read um, some of the results from your work, I thought, well, of course, uh, of course that is gotta be correct, you know? Um, are, 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 should we be shocked that um, areas that have more impervious services that have more concrete, and less canopy coverage of trees are also those areas that are lower income neighborhoods um, and that those effects are still felt to this day. Uh, it's just like, duh, it's gotta be the case. Um, well, it goes, e and, and the pernicious thing, Jason, is that it goes even deeper over 2020, the layers that have started appearing, not only in my dreams, but in the empirical work that we're doing is you look at the, I, I mean, I was just looking at the uh, COVID maps of various cities that I have. I was looking at, hmm the food deserts in various places that we have data. And I was looking at the violence, police violence that emerged as a very central issue of 2020 after the Floyd killing. And it was like, those maps are very similar to our heat maps. And so I've opened up into a space now where I'm thinking a lot more about, not, while heat is again, just an indicator of some other more systemic things that are at work here, and I think we could think about urban wildlife in a very similar kind of way as, as Chris Schell's paper from August 2020 in Science would indicate as well. Like we're, we're seeing the intersection of, of where and how these specific distributions of species are and their relationship to various planning processes that happened almost you know, a century ago. And so mm. that, that's the kind of stuff that's really starting to um, spark in my mind. It, it makes me, you know, realize it is it is not as simple. Uh, it'll never be as simple as oh, we'll just we'll uh, just um, these these structural and systemic issues of uh, social injustice and racism that are built into these communities. That it's not going to be as simple as going there and planting trees. Um, it's it's obviously a much more complex um, societal issue than that. Um, uh, uh, getting to that, though, you know, the, the, the modeling that, that you have done, you and you, that you and the super lab have done, um, are you relating, you know, these um, differences in the effects of um, local temperatures within urban environments to the materials themselves and the, the, st the structural configuration of the buildings? And, and is, is that potentially informing how to design an urban landscape in the future um, that is you know, is cooler and, and more equitable. Yeah, right. So, I mean, that's the thing we're seeing, for example, in these disinvested areas, where does the big box store go? I mean, where did 1950s, where did the freeways go? They went in the low cost neighborhoods, right? And where did the industrial fac facilities go? They were in the low cost neighborhoods. And so you see COVID rates go up because people are already uh, uh, the respiratory systems and immune systems are already compromised by living adjacent to polluted parts of a city and a region. And those were where the fact a lot of the industrial facilities, if they were built between like, you know, the 20s, 30s and uh, 70s, you're really seeing that play out. And so what materials were used? Those were the materials that amplify the temperatures. And what we're starting to do now is a lot more of these what, what are called comp, um, computational fluid dynamics modeling, where you're essentially taking, it's like SimCity, except for a very small area. You take a city block and you say, here's the city block. Here's what the materials of the, uh, materials of the buildings are composed of. Here's what the landscape looks like here. And you essentially create a digital version of that. And then what these models are able to do is they push a big plume of hot air through it and you get the eddying and all of the movement of the air as it moves around buildings, across trees. And depending on the amount of green space, the materials of the, um, of the buildings, et cetera, you, you're able to see what the diurnal profile of temperatures are on that city block. So we've done a few projects where we're saying we're taking a 16 unit 
uh, 16 units of development in a um, residential block and turning it up to 64 developments in a, in a city block. What forms of development would best manage temperatures? And that's where it gets super interesting because then you can kind of start moving the buildings around, tucking the parking under, um, you know, putting in just as a lot of people would, a lot of developers would do is a, a big parking lot in the middle and two to three story kind of horseshoe shaped multifamily residential apartments. Like we've, we've tested those and we've actually been able to find some designs that would um, actually reduce pre density temperatures in those multifamily residential developments. And so we're, we're going in that direction, but yet there's not a single city in the country right now that has actually um, required that of any development, even though that development's gonna be there for 30, 50, 80 years, while temperatures are gonna be turned up a fair bit. Is that true even, in, even where you are in Portland? Oh, for sure, oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely seeing hotter, lots more hotter heat, lots more heat waves coming through here, and that's part of the reason the fires too. While urban areas might amplify the heat, forests are drying up and far more susceptible to fires as well. I, you know, um, getting back to one of the earlier questions about um, you know, urban wildlife and temperatures, and I just I just thought I I can't believe that our fields. Uh, I'm, I have a conference coming up here in a couple of months that is a joint conference of multiple societies. I can't believe that, you know, urban planning and ecologists don't talk more. Um, you know, there are so many things that you've hit on that um, besides our shared um, compassion and, and desire to seek envir uh, environmental justice for everyone living in urban areas, but also the, the parallels between wanting um, a more a habitable landscape for people and for wildlife. Providing green spaces benefits people within urban areas. Providing green spaces within city environments benefits wildlife populations that use those, that breed in those areas, that winter in them, that migrate through them. We have so many parallels here. I'm just really uh, surprised that we don't have more, you know, channels of communication between our, our science fields. It's growing. I mean, I don't know what you've seen or others on the call, others on the uh, Zoom call have seen, but I remember going to ESA, Ecological Society of America, back in 2000 sure. and being the one track on urban ecology, and then in 2005 going and being one of three tracks in urban ecology, and then more recently going and seeing, you know, a dozens of tracks in urban ecology. So if that's an indication for at least, um, and even, even like people who are inducted into like publish into ESA like editorships and things like that. Like there's an increasing presence of people who are looking at the relationship between human dominated landscapes and wildlife as well as a lot of other ecosystem functions. So, I mean, the trend is going there. I just feel like we're very slow in this process for sure. It's been taking a long time and it's decades of, you know, it's decades legacy stuff that we're working with to try to, to try to, um, uh, address some of those. Yeah, yeah. Bye. You know, I remember um, as, a, as a grad student, I certainly don't remember, we had population ecology classes that I took as a master's and PhD student, landscape ecology, biogeography. There were, it was not an urban ecology class for me to take. Um, I have a lot more thoughts on that, but um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's good to, it's, it's, it's encouraging to hear that we're moving in, in, a, in, the, in the right direction. Um, yeah, I mean, this, it, I was talking to some folks about the eBird platform, for example, right? Like, I imagine a lot sure. of you are interested in that. And I was just thinking, like, how does the platform of eBird really integrate questions of environmental racism or structural injustice? And where does that intersection happen? And what's being posted on eBird are probably, um, uh, you know, if you were to look at you go look at the presence of trees, the presence of birds, the presence of kind of um, um, locations of these uh, uh, um, eber of, of bird sightings and things like that. It would be probably in cities very biased towards a specific demographic who are, and so part of it is like, how do we create systems? How do we create? And this question that Julia put up here is really interesting in the sense of, you know, uh, organizations that focus on conservation and incorporating environmental justice in their work, like. Yes, absolutely. How, 
how can we, I mean, the uh, Sierra Club and, you know, Audubon are like turning their um, editorial or their, um, their uh, boards and various projects to try to really be more um, centered in this work now. And I'm seeing that as really promising signs that 2020 is leaving, even though as hard as 2020 was for a lot of us, um, it, it's really the, I guess the silver lining is that we're really seeing some transformation happen at, on a structural level with boards of organizations, with more centering of environmental justice questions. Um, and I think that's all really gonna take some time. That's really gonna take some time, but. Um, I, I hope it's sustainable. I hope it's, it is sustained, I guess I should say. You know, we have the moment, uh, a lot of attention focused on a lot of issues that have been intentionally ignored because they're difficult to talk about. Yeah. And I, I, I hope we have the ability and uh, long-term vision to continue talking about them. Um, I, I, I looked at the clock, we're already at 7.50. And folks, I'm, I'm sorry, if, if you, if you want to get in a, a, a question, please do so. We're out there right on. <laughs> um, yeah, please do so. And uh, uh, Nathaniel, can we make it so people can turn on their microphones and open up their cameras if they want and ask you your question directly? Yeah, for sure. And right on. All right, so if anyone wants to ask um, Vivek a question directly, you're now able to unmute yourselves. You just roll a 20-sided die, and chances are you're not going to ask a question at the exact same moment somebody else has asked. You've been waiting your whole life to ask Vivek a question. <laughs> and traveling through time, you're right here. I have a bunch of questions for you all, though. I know that. <laughs> it's not coming this way. I always have a bag full of questions I like to run around with. <laughs> oh, Tom, are you trying to ask a... Tom, you're still muted if you're trying to ask a question. Oh, you can't mute yourself, really? There we go. Says, oh, now am I unmuted? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Tom. Yeah. So is, is the heat basically the retention of the solar energy rather than the heat generated by urban activity? I mean, where is, is the main? By and large, by and large. I mean, anthropogenic heat is the term that's often used. The technical term that's often used, Tom, is the idea that, you know, cars and buildings are all um, have, you know, combustion or some form of uh, waste heat that's generated. And that's about a degree or two is what we see. Maybe not in New York City. It might be a little higher, but most cities, we see about a degree or two effect of anthropogenic heat, but the sun's radiation on surfaces is by and large the lion's share of the, of the heat we're seeing in cities. So we should all live in white houses and have all reflective surfaces and all that sort of thing, I guess, huh? That's yeah, I mean, you bounce it, right? You bounce it away, but the thing is that heat is still trapped. So those places, yeah, that bounce it away. Uh, LA tried a really interesting... Um, uh, application. I don't know if any of you saw this, but they painted a bunch of roads in a neighborhood with this uh, white paint. The roads, and I don't know what that did to glare for drivers or other things, but that's a different story. But what they were finding is that the surface temperature was really m cool. Like it bounced 85% of that solar radiation away, though the people crossing the road, if you were to do an, a test of the ambient temperature, meaning the air temperature as you walk by, it was the same temperature as it was before you painted the road white. Because what was happening is that solar radiation was hitting the road, bouncing back up, and the people walking across at two meters above the ground were experiencing the same solar radiation they're going. And so for them, they're just sweating equally as much. It's not any cooler. Maybe their soles of their shoes are cooler, but their head is still and their body is still equally sweating and hot. So there's these tech, these these um, applications are a little bit more nuanced as well that we're slowly starting to find as well. You know, yeah, mountaintop temperatures are increasing five times the rate globally, we think, as lower elevation temps. And we don't clearly understand that at the moment, but the leading theory is that it's a sabido effect, this idea that, that as it gets warmer and snow melts, exposes darker rocks, and that uh, absorbs and retains heat for longer. And, positive feedback cycle up there. So 
That's interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, question from Erica Vivek about the height of heat measurement. And do you know of research on temperature profiling in cities? Yeah, it really matters. I mean, elevation and temperature are so highly correlated, right? They're like, you go up, you were just talking about that, Jason, in the mountaintop example of rapid acceleration of heat in the top. And what we're seeing in cities is very similar. I've been spending a long time trying to understand what happens between that surface temperature and just two meters above the ground. That difference turns out to be really complicated because the, the, the if there's a, an asphalt a, a right next to a green space, like a lawn, those two have very different, um, uh, essentially very different temperatures and pressure gradients are different. So you, the hot will want to move towards the cold and the cold will want to move towards the hot. So you get turbulence moving at a very micro scale from what the engineers tell me is happening. And so what you see is a mixing of air at different, um, uh, different altitudes. And that mixing is affected by surface, largely by the surface roughness factor that a lot of biophysicists look at. And so um, that's, that to me, it's way over my head, that stuff, I have to admit. But what's super interesting is that the, the composition of the landscape will really affect how much of that mixing is happening. And so if you have uniform like asphalt across one space and you're going in and looking at temperatures there, it's pretty, it's remarkably predictable from the surface to two meters above. Whereas if you go to a, a heterogeneous landscape, which cities are mixed with, you get a lot more of a complex movement of that air because of that um, kind of uh, pressure gradients that are generated at the local level. Um, but again, way over my head, I would love to have some biophysicists help me think through that, who I work with occasionally, but it, it's mostly hard for me to understand. Um, and then you get above the buildings and you get into the canopy layer uh, and then the boundary layer dynamics that are even higher up. So there's some really interesting um, fo folks working on global models that are trying to do that, but nothing has penetrated down to the urban two meter above the ground level to think about wind dynamics there that I've been able to see. Liza and Brendan, did you have a question you said earlier? Yeah, I have a question that might be outside of the knowledge base of this conversation, but just uh, with the pandemic and looking at the heat maps in urban areas and the COVID maps in urban areas as the planet just continues to heat up, do you foresee there being larger problems with pandemics and kind of it interfacing with urban areas in a similar way if we don't kind of fix this or it being a breeding ground for new pandemics that could, you know, have similar effects of COVID on people? Yeah, I don't, I mean, yeah, that may be outside, but I, I the, I mean, the origins of the pandemic, we know, you know, human, it's what you all study, like human nature interactions and specifically in relation to, um, I mean, the things that I've seen is cities growing and going into hinterlands a lot more, particularly in uh, rapidly uh, urbanizing parts of the world. And so as you get people going further and further into uh, what used to be, um, what used to be non-human dominated landscapes and largely, um, uh, you know, changing development, the, the idea would be, or at least the concern would be, and some folks out of Hawaii are doing some really interesting work on this in Southeast Asia, where we're looking at kind of as urban areas encroach into um, jungle, forest, other kinds of landscapes, that, hu that likelihood of human animal interaction increases. And as we know, like um, uh, SARS, SARS uh, COVID, uh, COV2 has been circulating in other species for a long time. It's been on the planet forever, um, arguably for a very long time, and it's just now getting to the human species. And so the idea would be, is we're expanding into these hinterlands, there, the human interaction with animals could increase, which could potentially expand. In terms of the relationship to heat, that's a little bit more tricky, and I think a little bit more socially constructed, which is hard to, hard to kind of, in my mind, piece together. I'm sure there's something there. I'll just put it in the chat, but I guess I'll just ask, just because um, you, so you mentioned eBird, and we at VC do a lot with eBird and iNaturalist. 
Yeah. And it seems like I watched um, the video that Jason sent out and you're kind of making these like hyper local, local temperature maps and you know, like f really fine scale temperature differentials and, and uh, trends. It seems like there'd be some you know, kind of natural, um, you know, partnership with you then eBird or iNaturalist or other community scientist efforts and i'm sure that with the, like how insanely fine scale your temperature maps is like i'm sure there's really some really interesting potential there that i think i'd be very eager to kind of look more into yeah i'd be glad to get into that a bit more i mean there might be i mean we i'll just tell you this side project we just got some money from national science foundation to spend the next four years looking at stress of flora large scale what i call charismatic megaflora um, to look at the stress of three species. So what we have, Douglas fir out here in the Pacific Northwest, Douglas fir, big leaf maple, and red cedar. Um, these species we're seeing, like the cities are providing us a natural laboratory in some ways, where if we have these fine scale measurements of temperature, we know in an area where a red cedar that's 85 years old, you know, 112 feet tall uh, in, in a hot part of a city, Whereas the same tree, 85 years old, 112 feet tall in a, a, a rural, not so hot part of the region, we're seeing completely different uh, vulnerability curves on these. And um, these, these, the same tree, you would think well-established at that age, we're seeing very different functional type effects. And I imagine the same thing is playing out potentially with, with you know, urban wildlife as well, but we have just barely scratched the surface on that. Love to, love to dig yeah. into that a bit more. Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking like, you know, if you took bird sightings, which are obviously gonna be heavily biased depending on where you are in the city um, yep. and, you know, kind of comparing them to the, the level of heat, the heat index or, you know, like, you know, kind of layering up and just kind of seeing like, do some birds like it hotter? Or do some mm -hmm. avoid those hot, you know, just kind of random like patterns and stuff like that, I think would be just, incredible for you know just I think it's interesting but just I think there's a lot of potential there for you know instigating green spaces if the data supports that or yep. for instance. Nice I like where that's going. I really it, like it, that. it makes me think you know in evasion ecology population and modeling dynamics we often think of um, urban areas as being hubs for the introduction of new invasive species because, you know, what, what I was taught is because, well, there's so much traffic volume and there are transportation hubs. And so, you know, you're rolling the die and you just have greater probability of one of those events um, being successful and colonizing. And, you know, those heat maps and Kevin's question makes me think, yeah, but it's warmer there. <laughs> In some parts of the city, you said it could be 20 degrees warmer in other parts of, of the city, AKA similar to the climate that that species has evolved with. Um, and I wonder about the, pop, the, 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 you know, the possibility for invasion dynamics actually be driven by localized temperature more than, you know, vehicle count. I think that so. something that really got me interested was you, I, I believe in the video, you mentioned that for the, uh, the temperature surveys, you do one in the morning, one in the afternoon and one in the evening, you, you through day. Like that by itself, three different, you know, highly sensitive climate samples and, you know, maybe some birds like it cooler in the day and warmer when they roost for the evening or they're just, they're, it's just so fine scale. It seems like there's infinite things you could do with that data almost. Yeah, we actually took that. We, we take sometimes even midnight and even 2 a.m. So it's morning, afternoon, evening. And we do, we've done some 2 a.m. like campaigns and it's been really interesting because you can see which areas cool down in the middle and which areas don't cool down in the middle of the night. And by the time the sun comes back up again, it reheats. And so one would be, it'd be really interesting, especially if you have some kind of nesting behavior of specific birds, like are they selecting nests in areas that are warmer, cooler? I mean, there's some super interesting questions there that I think are not even, we haven't even come close to because we don't have the data to kind yeah. of start asking those questions. Like you're saying that just, I mean, go do some owl surveys and maybe the owls prefer cold evenings and warm days or, whatever it just oh man it just there's so many so much opportunity there i love it yeah thank you thank you kevin for that question uh, in regards to julie's question about green rooftops um makes me also wonder you know is it as simple as you know is there a straight linear 
benefit from adding green space and trees to urban environments? Does adding a single tree make a measurable effect or is there, you know, in wildlife, we often see these relationships, these area sensitivity relationships where it's not enough to have forest to have some species of warbler. You need 50 acres of forest at least before you even have that species. And then from there, you see a linear relationship, increasing forest, increasing probability of occup occupancy. Um, what about that for urban areas? Is it, do, do we need to do something big to, to move the needle or does incremental change um, work? Ah, it's, it's, it's kind of like the outcomes you're looking for, right? It's like, if we're looking to cool neighborhoods, that's a whole, a whole thing. If we're looking to expand biodiversity and deepen that, that's a whole different approach. And I get kind of caught up in this cycle sometimes because um, part of what we're seeing is cities just being like, it's getting hot, throw a bunch of trees at it. And the communities are like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You've just put a bunch of trees in, property values have gone up and guess what? I'm being gentrified out of this space. And so this whole green gentrification wow. question has been coming up a lot in our work. And uh, we have an interesting project uh, funded by Robert Wood Johnson looking at how do you engage communities in their place, not just with heat and air quality and kinds of, and, and potentially birds in a sense though that this project doesn't get into birds um, with the tree canopy and greening. And we're trying to get a sense for how do you do that with the community and for the community and have some co-ownership and maintenance built into some of these processes as opposed to just dumping a bunch of greenery into a neighborhood and, and, and taking off. And so part of this is like this co-creation, which is I think a lot of where this, you know, co-management research and even in natural resources is headed these days, um, as, at least from what I'm reading. So um, what we've seen in, in Phoenix, throwing a tree at something, 50% failure, right? We have 50%, like the, I talked to the um, public, uh, the public works director of Phoenix. And he's saying, I don't like trees because you put, I pay hundred thousand dollars and I lose $50,000 of that in trees because they're just, they have mortality within a year or two, unless we have a crew to go out and take good care of these trees. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We're, unless there's a real concerted effort, not just a capital of to buy the trees and to put them in the ground, um, which in and of itself is pretty hard in highly sealed up areas, for example, that have been disinvested over decades. Um, but even if you cut out a tree well, four by six tree well, and you drop a tree in there, like the surrounding area is blistering hot and that tree would likely have some challenges. And so there, there's a different model that we're really trying to uncover and develop here around what does it take to bring trees into a neighborhood, not necessarily partly for, green, uh, for, for cooling, though trying to think about how do you engage the community in that process because that tree could help uh, help think more generally about what other strategies of cooling do you have because a tree by itself may not reduce the temperatures but by 0 0.1 or 2 degrees um so yeah i mean the cooling effect of trees there's yeah it's it's a big one it's a big i mean it's a big question not that it's really that big of an effect that we're necessarily seeing Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I recognize it's we're after eight o'clock folks and I will not be offended if you slide, silently sneak out the Zoom back door or whatever the equivalent of it is. And, um, but um, if you have a few more minutes, Vivek, is that okay? Or do you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe if there's a couple more questions, um, I know we had some questions proposed earlier and people registered about um, planting native trees versus, uh, in reference to Pete Kirby Miller's comment there about female ginkgo biloba trees um, in cities. And I think you, you might just address that, the, the, the challenges for some of our native species of living in a concrete well are, are, are high to plant a sugar maple in there, for example. Um, uh, yeah. Let's see, I'm trying to read through question by Liza. How does co-ownership of those uh, efforts counteract the rising property prices that result from planting trees versus a separate issue to address? Yeah, I mean, I'd quickly just comment that part of this broader agenda is especially in disinvested communities where planting trees has become a very fashionable thing right now. Um, 
for mm. municipalities. Part of the challenge that we're trying to think about is, um, is really around broader issues of wealth creation in a neighborhood. And it's less necessarily about the greening, but how do you in go from rent to own processes? How do you go, how do you create kind of uh, community-based green space management, um, anti-displacement policies? There's a really interesting study that came out of UC Irvine um, looking at PRADS, which is park-related anti-displacement um, uh, uh, policies. And so there are strategies that are starting to emerge that are showing promise in terms of not just the uh, co-ownership piece, which I think is essentially is essential, uh, um, though also like as property values rise, what are the options that municipalities and and uh, can can enable to reduce the likelihood of displacement? Because we know the market is really going to push push people out relatively quickly, and we've seen that happening all over. Whether it's New York. Um, whether a, a highly dense area of New York and LA or even smaller parts of the country, we've seen that happening. Question about Kevin, and, and I, I think you've talked about this, um, but do you use community scientists and volunteers? And is there an effort to include those communities, um, those red line communities in uh, some of this community science work? Yeah, so we do almost all our work is based with municipalities. And one of the things municipalities we are able to encourage them to do is to work with local nonprofits to do this work who are engaging. These are social and environmental or climate justice nonprofits to engage uh, communities in this work. Um, one of the key pieces of this is remunerating. I mean, we call them volunteers and they are volunteers and um, we provide trainings and all of that, but there is a whole piece of remunerating volunteers. And that's where we go to foundations and other folks to try to ask for money to bring it back into the community. Because without that and asking people to do free work to collect data, I think is old school. And we really need to move into the next generation of this work of getting people, especially um, environmental justice communities as it's often called these days to, to be remunerated and paid for hourly time and so we're we usually set aside about I mean one volunteer would say spend about five to six hours with us and we usually put in um, between 25 to 30 dollars an hour for that volunteer to participate and so it really gives an incentive for communities to participate um, in this work um, and I was amazed even during the pandemic people were super into this um, and again I'm serving as an advisory role in a lot of these projects um, and there's a whole uh, crew now that's that's running these programs right now but that, wow, that that is a yeah that is a topic i'd love to talk to you about uh more at at some point we have um, another hour <laughs> yeah 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 i gotta go um, pick my little guy from from his uh yeah uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. And just a, a couple things before everyone um, jumps off. I'm going to, um, in the Zoom confirmation email you received, you had a link to this Wonder Room. And I'm going to head over there afterwards. And you haven't checked out Wonder. It's just kind of fun. You know, it's, it's not the same as all hanging out in the brew pub afterwards and meeting new people and having a chance to socialize. Uh, but if you want to check it out, I'll be over there. And I think some other people will right after this. You can't be in Zoom and in Wonder at the same time. So go ahead and copy that link or open up Wonder and you'll have to close out of Zoom. Um, and then Vivek, I just wanna say that, you know, for more than a, I, for 20 years, people have been asking me, I do bird banding demonstrations or something, or they come out with me a, a day in the field to do, see what it's like to put satellite tags on a bird or something. And inevitably somebody will say to me, you know, my daughter, my son, really wants to help birds, really loves the outdoors and wants to, and wants to help them. Should, what should they do? Should they, how do they become an ornithologist? And I always tell them, no, yeah, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. You know, for 20 years, I've been telling people, you need to become an urban planner. Mm. You know, you need to become an urban planner and figure out how to make cities um, be better for people and for wildlife. And those two things probably aren't mutually exclusive. You need to be a uh, you know, going to investment banking to figure out a way to make betting on the environment profitable or investing in our cities um, and green spaces more profitable, but shouldn't become an ornithologist. 
That's um, really interesting, Jason, because the, one of the most influential classes, I, two of the most influential classes I had in college was one was agroecology and the other was ornithology. And I spent, pro, I, I'm still an avid birder. I spend, mo, I spend most of my weekends oh, really? <laughs> uh, birding. And um, it, it's, it's a way to understand the relationship among us. I don't need to say this to I me. Mean, I'm preaching the choir here, but a, a, a foundation in ecology, I think, co couldn't really be replaced with anything more valuable. I, I mean, that is something that I think you can then become an urban planner later. And those ecological concepts will be essential for your ability to really navigate the complexity of, of design, engineering, um, policy, and community engagement, and all the things for urban planners do, but ecology at the foundation of that, I think couldn't be a more important um, uh, training. I don't, I think we're arguing for a joint degree. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, I couldn't thank you more yeah, um, sure. to be here tonight. It's such a pleasure to meet you and I'm a big fan of the, the, the work that your lab produces and um, just thank you for your time and um, for your passion on all the subjects that we talked about tonight. Um, and on behalf of the Southern Science Community and Vermont Center for Ego Studies, thank you very much, Vivek. Yeah, appreciate it. I, I'll come out. I'd love to participate on a bird banding uh, project with you. I, I worked with John Marsluff up at University of Washington on a bunch of bird banding. Done. So I'm, yeah, I'd love to come out and do it on the, uh, in New England as well. You're welcome anytime. Okay. Um, Thanks all. Thank you very much, folks. And uh, if you're headed to the one room, great. And uh, we'll see everyone next month. Take care, everybody. All right. Thanks, Hi, Vivek. Thanks again, buddy. Yeah, thank you.